This is Retrospective Facilitation, a podcast for facilitators that want to make their retrospectives even more effective. Listen to industry experts, authors, and executives that advocate powerful retros, share their stories and insights on how to reflect, adjust, and become more effective. To receive updates on the latest episodes, subscribe to our newsletter at thisisretrospectivefacilitation.com and win a chance to ask questions to our guests. Do you find it hard to run remote retrospectives? Have you perhaps given up on running them because the team is so disengaged? In this episode, we will help with that, interviewing David Horowitz, a facilitator with years of experience in remote retrospectives, so much that he created a product to help solve the issues he and many others experienced in remote retrospectives. David, welcome to the show. In one of your past interviews, you said that a critical piece that gets lost in Agile is continuous improvement. Why is it so important? And how is it connected to retrospectives? If I were to define Agile in just two words, it would actually be those two, continuous improvement. And, you know, we go through all these training courses and we learn a lot from experts and from each other. But in the end, it's all about those two words. And what's amazing to me is how often we say, yeah, let's follow the Scrum guidelines or let's follow Lean or pick your methodology of poison. But we forget that the fundamental premise behind these methodologies is continuous improvement. So to me, you know, Agile really rests on two pillars. The first pillar is product improvement and the second pillar is process improvement. So product improvement is the part we we sort of intuitively understand. It's having sprint reviews and demos. Um, It's making sure we're working on the right thing and delivering small product increments. It's the part that if you just ask someone who doesn't have too much experience with Agile, what is Agile about? They'll probably understand pretty quickly it's about improving the product, which is great. And that's equally important to the second pillar, which is the process improvement pillar. And that's the one that we more often than not forget about. So process improvement is how we work together. It's not just the product that should be improving incrementally over time. It's also the way that we're building that product. It, any team that that forms in the first week, the first month, the first three months should not be as efficient and as productive as a team that's been together for much longer. But that assumption rests on us improving uh, over time. And so just as you know, a demo is the meeting that catalyzes product improvement and feedback uh, for the product improvement pillar of Agile, to me, the, the retrospective is the meeting that catalyzes the process, process improvement portion of Agile. And unfortunately, for a whole variety of reasons that we'll probably get into, the retrospective is typically the first meeting to go when it comes to to Agile teams. Um, And that really limits your productivity and your gains in continuous improvement over time. The the object of a retrospective to me is really, you can just sum it up in one word, actually. So it's even shorter than the two words we just spoke about. The one word that uh, is the goal of any retrospective is learning. And the, the idea of a retrospective is to dial in on hopefully just one area of importance that uh, you're trying to get better at and to learn something about it. Because if you learn something about it in the retrospective, you're learning collectively instead of on your own. And then when the team learns collectively, hopefully they can go forward into the upcoming iteration and use that knowledge to to improve. But the retrospective is the built-in catalyst. It's the built-in driver of that learning process. And without it, we can do learning independently. We can certainly Google for things and research things on our own. We can certainly have water cooler conversations between me and you. But if we're trying to learn and improve as a team, you need to all be together in the same room, whether physically or virtually, uh, to have that opportunity to learn collectively. So that's the point of the retrospective. How is a remote retrospective different from a co-located one? Yeah. (laughs) So if you ask an Agile purist, is there such a thing as a remote team in Agile? The answer likely would be no. But the reality is we live in a geographically dispersed world and the majority of software is built in a distributed fashion. Uh, You know, that might mean you have people working across continents. So there's the time zone issue built in. Um, But it also might be something much simpler. You could even have a distributed team within the same building. If you have multiple floors and people are sitting on different floors, you probably send instant messaging uh, back and forth to each other, whether it's on Slack or some other product. That's a distributed team, whether you realize it or not. Uh, And the other way to look at distributed teams, just to make sure we're covering our bases here, is 
in my mind, and this this tends to be a controversial statement uh, with some folks, but in my mind, at least, if you have just one person on your team who is remote, you have a remote team. Uh, you might not realize it. You might never have defined it before as remote, but you have a remote team. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, suppose there's a 10-person team and nine people are sitting around one conference table and you have one person dialing in. Imagine you are that person dialing in. Do you have an equal playing field? Do you have equal opportunity to voice your ideas? Are you able to understand the conversation as well as the other nine people at the same physical conference table? Almost certainly your answer would be no. And so if you are that person in that situation, you realize the team is remote, but maybe the other nine don't. And once you settle in on this realization and you internalize it and you start using it to your advantage, you realize that, hey, once one person's remote, we have to act as a remote team. So when it comes to retrospectives in particular, um, you know, if you talk to an agile coach or you read the literature out there, uh, you'll see these wonderful facilitation techniques. Um, typically, they involve sticky notes, flip charts, markers, Legos, other fun toys, uh, just ways for us to be able to physically interact with the world. There's something tactile about it that improves our learning process. But again, if you have just one person on your team who's calling in, you no longer have a level playing field and you have a remote team. So can you use those facilitation techniques? And my answer to that question is just an outright no. Um, unless you have the equal opportunity for everyone to participate in the meeting, it's an unfair situation. So when it comes to retrospectives, we have to ask ourselves, all these facilitation techniques are fantastic and we need to learn from them and use them more frequently. But given the definition of remote teams being one or more people uh, who is calling into the meeting, how often can we really use them? And what's the alternative? When the majority of the team is collocated, what do you think about having someone in the room being a proxy for the remote person? Yeah, so that's certainly one option. Um, and if the person, what I think of it when you when you say it that way, the way I think about it is um, you have almost a, a buddy system um, built into your retrospective. And this is one approach to solving some of the bigger pain points when it comes to engagement in remote retrospectives is that every person who's dialing in should have one assigned buddy in the co-located location, in the uh, physical conference table. And that person's job is not only, of course, to participate themselves as an individual in the retrospective, but to uh, take the ideas and inputs from that other individual their buddy um, and make sure that they're surfaced as well in the retrospective. And not just that, but also to make sure that person has the time to uh, add their ideas to the retrospective verbally. You know, sometimes it's hard to get your voice involved in the conversation um, if you're remote. So what the person on site can do is say, hey, folks, uh, let's just take a moment to ask the person on the line, do they have something else to add? And it's that person's job to continuously bring that up because it's so easy to forget. So that's definitely one way of uh, encouraging more equal engagement in the retrospective when you have a remote team. There are others as well. Um, one thing that I would I, I suggest to teams to try uh, is if you have that one person who's remote, make everybody remote. In other words, instead of having a physical conference table and one person calling in, switch that paradigm completely to go to the lowest common denominator, which is everybody calling into the meeting. So if you go back to your conference, uh, to, your, to your tables, and you say, from your laptop, dial into this meeting, and everybody does that remotely, then you have, again, an equal playing field. And of course, that may work for you and it may not, but at least being open to experimenting with that as a way to encourage engagement um, and also to encourage empathy and sympathy for um, the people who always have to dial in, uh, it's a nice way to build team. David, in your experience, what is the baseline? What is the bare minimum for a remote retrospective? Yeah, so the... There's minimums and there's minimums on a per team basis, and they're two different things. Uh, in other words, there is a minimum across the board, irrespective of team, and that is a communication mechanism. There are examples that I've come across of teams who actually perform at a high level with the remote participants in the retrospective emailing their ideas. Now, this is not a suggestion. I am not advocating for this. But these were high-performing teams who had a long history of working together who were able to operate this way and found it effective because of time zone differences. So when I always talk about what's the baseline, 
I don't like to say you must have X because there are examples that fall outside the the eighty percent rule of what I'd assume you might need for a retrospective. So there's there's the baseline, and then there's the baseline on a per team basis, and that's where I really like to talk about because that's something that should be discovered culturally uh, within your team. Um, if video is an option and people are willing to go on video, then that's obviously better. Uh, than voice. And if people don't have video, but they have voice and they're willing to go on voice, that's obviously better than email for most teams. But that's something you can discover culturally uh, as you learn together. There are teams who, uh, you know, I, I give talks at conferences all the time. And one of the things that I, I have this slide where there's three images. Um, one image is of a fully co-located team having a lot of fun around uh, in one room. Another image is a uh, people calling in, but audio only. And the last image is uh, somebody who is calling in with video. And I ask people in, in my talk, if you could choose how, how you'd like to work, um, which one of the three would you choose? And of course, 75% of people pick co-located. Most people want to be in a physical office with others, with, the, with their colleagues. And usually about the 20% of people pick the video conference. But every single time I've done this talk without fail, there's 5% of people, one to two people in the room, 10 people in the room, depending on the size of the talk, who actually prefer just audio. They don't want video on. And I've asked them, why? Because to me, this is foreign, right? To me, I prefer video. I like the face-to-face the -face interaction as much as possible. But there's some legitimate reasons why. Um, one is I, I work from home and my room is a disaster mess behind me. And it's embarrassing to show that to people. And I'd rather just call in with audio. Another person told me that my bandwidth at home is bad and audio works great. Video does not for me. And I don't have the ability because I'm rural to upgrade my bandwidth. So there are legitimate reasons to uh, go with audio only. And so to me, when you ask baseline, um, and this is generally true with my approach to Agile, that if we ever say, this is always true, almost by definition, we're not taking a bottom-up Agile approach to the problem. So yes, you need a communication paradigm, but what that communication paradigm is should be ideally up to the team. David worked for several years with remote teams. I asked him what were some challenges he had to face when facilitating remote retrospectives. Yeah, so we had, I was working at a large international bank, and we had people spread throughout the US where I'm located, as well as throughout Asia, uh, and even a couple people in Europe as well. Um, and so this is where I really started to understand the complexities of remote retrospectives and how much more challenging they are than co-located retrospectives. You know, it's co-located retrospectives are hard enough to get right, and you add in this remote piece to it, and it becomes significantly harder. So the, I have a story there of the first time this really clicked with me, um, which was when uh, we were running a retrospective and it was really audio only. There was no bandwidth uh, for the team that was in India uh, to be able to have video. They didn't have support for that. So it was audio only. And we were asking people to uh, just go around in a round robin type of way and say what the ideas they had to start working on going forward. Because again, in my naive way of doing things back then, I didn't quite understand that you needed something better from a facilitation perspective, even with remote, to get them to be engaged. Um, and it was just complete silence. Um, and finally, what happened was I said, okay, here are 10 ideas that the team here in the US has already mentioned as options. So here they are. What I'd like to do now is let's do something like planning poker to see the complexity of uh, each of these ideas um, and see where we can get some energy behind one of them so we can start to improve going forward. And it was fascinating what happened. So with the people co-located around the conference table here in the US, everyone, as you should with planning poker, uh, thought to themselves which card they wanted to play. And they all put their estimate forward about how hard it would be um, for this particular learning item or experiment to go forward. And on the other line, uh, with the people in India, I heard a click on the phone. And it's complete silence, like it went dead. Um, I thought they had dropped off. Uh, well, it turns out they didn't drop off. About five minutes later, they came back and they said, well, we uh, estimate five. I, I don't know if it was five. I'm making that number up. But we, we estimate the following. And it just it blew my mind how poorly of a job I had done explaining the purpose not only of planning poker as it pertains to this the, the retrospective, but also how 
poorly they must be engaged with this meeting uh, to have to go through something like that. The first thing that occurred to me afterwards was if you're in person, uh, you have all of, as I mentioned earlier, all of these physical tactile uh, objects you can interact with. So how can we replicate that if we were remote? And I found you know, one or two options online, um, little pieces of software that somebody had built in their free time on the weekends to try to get people to um, be more engaged with the process. So for example, if it was a start, stop, continue retrospective, and again, I'm not advocating just running start, stop, continue in the retrospective. This is purely for illustration only. Um, but the start, stop, continue uh, retrospective board would be set up online. And then people could independently add their ideas to each one of those columns in this piece of software which helped. Um, you know, if your baseline is round robin audio, doing something like that is significantly better because it gives people a mechanism for communication. But it's still not really good enough because as we all know, if we were in person, we'd be following likely the five stages uh, of a retrospective that Diana and Esther talk about in, uh, in their book called Agile Retrospectives, which includes much more than just a simple start, stop, continue retrospective. So then I started questioning, well, what could we do there? Um, and, you know, eventually what happened was I, I got so obsessed with this problem that um, I quit my job and I actually founded a company called Retrium, which is trying to solve this problem once and for all for everybody. Uh, so, for example, on Retrium now we have uh, something called the Team Radar, which you might be familiar with as a retrospective facilitation technique more broadly. It's you have five, for example, five different spokes um, that you rate your team on um, things like. Uh, testing, things like communication with the product owner, things like autonomy in our work, you can come up with the spokes yourself and you ask everyone to rate themselves on each one of these subjects. You aggregate the results and you figure out, well, where are we the weakest as a team? Um, maybe it's our testing processes. Um, where are we the strongest? And that piece of data gives you something to focus on in the upcoming uh, portion of the retrospective. So if you, for example, figure out that our team's not very good at testing, instead of jumping right into start, stop, continue, now we have a focus to start, stop, continue. We can say, well, as it pertains to testing, what should we start doing? As it pertains to testing, what should we stop doing? And so on. And all of that thing, all of those ideas are things that are not novel. They're not new. Um, these go way back in the retrospectives world, but doing them for remote teams is new. That's, it's very difficult to do that. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. When we are facilitating co-located retrospectives, we have a chance of having one-on-one -on -one conversations with the team in preparation of the retrospective meeting. How do you do that with a remote team? Yeah, so remote teams have to be much more intentional about unintentional conversation. So let me unpack what I mean there because I worded that very carefully. So if you are a co-located team, you will end up bumping into your teammates at the proverbial water cooler in the bathroom. You'll ask people to go to coffee. You will ask them to go to lunch with you. And this will happen naturally. You don't necessarily have to plan for this in advance. And in the conversations you have with those individuals, you will learn on average so much more than you will ever learn about what's really going on in your company uh, and then in a formal meeting. The trouble with remote teams is that those hallway conversations don't happen naturally. And so for us, uh, what we have tried to do, we have a remote company ourselves, um, is a couple of things. So the basic, most obvious one that most teams are doing, but I want to at least mention it to make sure it's out there, is to have a, a channel on Slack or some sort of um, location that's understood that this is our joking channel. This is our water cooler. Um, and you can put whatever you want in there. It can be about movies. It can be about TV shows. It doesn't matter. It, just to have some place to talk about things that are not work-related. That's the obvious one. But it's not good enough in my mind um, because it's not just asynchronous conversation that's required. It's also synchronous conversation, meaning you need to have live conversations with people. So one of the things that we do is we've realized that, hey, there's no reason why you can't grab a coffee with someone even though you're on a remote meeting or have a remote team. I mean, this is something that if you're in person, you'd say, let's go down the street and go to the coffee shop. But this is the same thing that's true if you have a remote team. So for example, I'll ping people on our Slack group and I'll say, hey, I'm going to go grab a coffee. Anyone want to join? And despite the fact that they are remote, they will do the same. We'll fire up a Zoom video chat and we'll have coffee together. And we don't talk about work, very intentionally do not talk about work. Um, and so it's the unintentional conversations that you'd have normally in, the, in person are, are possible 
for remote teams, but you have to be more intentional about creating those opportunities. It's very easy to hide behind your computer and, and a remote team and never talk to anybody else um, synchronously. And that's a huge mistake. So that's the number one thing that I'd recommend as it pertains to remote teams. And it certainly applies to retrospectives as well. If you, whatever you would do to prep for your retrospective, if you were co-located, you can also do if you were distributed. You just have to be more intentional. David, are there specific skills to hone when you are a remote facilitator? Yeah, so remote facilitation is something I would not recommend to a new facilitator because if you're still learning about facilitation, that's hard enough. Um, people don't realize that facilitation is a skill that needs to be learned just like any other skill on your job. And just because you are a scrum master doesn't mean that you're an expert facilitator just because in the same way that if you are now have a computer science degree from university, it doesn't mean you're a professional software developer. This is not a criticism. This is just the, the reality of the world. Skills take take time to learn. So if you are new to facilitation, I highly recommend finding a job that enables you to learn in a co-located environment. It's hard enough to do it that way. So putting that aside, once you are a facilitator of a remote team, uh, you have some extra challenges. So the first extra challenge is going to be engagement. Um, engagement with people who are remote, especially if they are more introverted, is extremely challenging. Um, one thing that I actually recommend is to hand off your facilitation duties to the remote person or one of the remote people. And the reason that I recommend this is because uh, if you've ever taken any, any courses in um, supply chain management or in operations of a business, you'll know that uh, the, the slowest cog in a chain is the limiting factor of the production line. So if you, know, you have five widgets and each widget can produce two, or each machine can produce two widgets per hour, then you have a very consistently high performing production machine. But if one of them can only produce one widget per hour, then that machine is going to be the limiting factor of your overall production in the system. So why did I mention that? It actually is very similar to facilitation with teams. Because if you're trying to learn collectively, and remember, that's how I started this whole the, the podcast talking about how that's the purpose of a retrospective, collective learning, then the person who's going to limit you in your ability to collectively learn as a team the most is likely the person who's remote. So what should you do? If you give that person the, the role of the facilitator, or hopefully they volunteer for that role, um, then that person will modulate the conversation. That person will be the one who's forcing uh, the, the conversation forward and facilitating for you. And as a result of that, if they don't understand something, they control the pace of the conversation and they'll slow things down to their rate, just like a production line would with the slowest machine in, in, the, in the chain. So what I'd recommend trying is having the person who's remote be the facilitator rather than you do it yourself. Uh, and I think that that's one way of encouraging greater engagement um, in, in, the, in the process. Rotating facilitators in remote retrospectives. When you assign the role, what do you do if uh, the person isn't willing to prepare or to switch the retrospective format? Yeah, so the key word in your question, I think, was the word assign. So if you are assigning a role to someone, then unless you are very much in tune with what they really want, it's unlikely that they're going to be excited about this role. They may go along with it if you're their manager, but they're unlikely to be really motivated to learn how to do it effectively. So the key word there is assign. What I usually say is... Look, anybody can be the facilitator of the retrospective. There's actually no reason why the Scrum Master has to be that person, but it should be volunteer only. Um, and if you are assigning that role, then it's unlikely it will work. But the other part of that, and this is really important, is the way that you rotate the role of the facilitator in a retrospective does not necessarily have to be within the team itself. So... Of course, if you rotate the role within the team, uh, you'll share learning about how hard it is to facilitate an effective retrospective. But there's an alternative if you're not finding enough takers on um, sharing the facilitation role, which is to create something called a circle of retrospective facilitators in your company. So this is something I picked up on at a retrospective facilitators gathering a couple of years ago that I found absolutely fascinating, um, which is Suppose there you have a company of 500 people and maybe you know 20 of them are really interested in facilitation. Well, that's fantastic. You have 20 people, but they might not all be on one team. It's unlikely that they are. So if all of these people are volunteering to be retrospective facilitators within the company, 
you can then tap into that resource and bring one of them into your team for your retrospective to help you facilitate. This has a couple of interesting advantages uh, and some disadvantages too, which I can touch on, but some interesting advantages here. One of which is one complaint that I hear about retrospectives all the time is that they're boring. We do the same thing again and again, and it just gets boring. Well, of course it does if you're doing the same thing again and again. So what are you doing about that? Introducing a circle of retrospective facilitators is one fix because you're no longer limited to the facilitator on your team's knowledge of all of the techniques that they have in their toolbox. Everybody's facilitation technique toolbox is limited by definition because we're all humans. We don't know all of them. But if you bring someone completely new, then it shakes things up. And the way they facilitate can be interesting and engaging and will promote uh, more widespread engagement on the retrospective on your team. So that's one big advantage. But there's an even more powerful advantage to this approach. And that is that it promotes information sharing in your organization. So if you are identifying a problem within your team that you're struggling on fixing, and you have the same people in the meeting in the retrospective every single time, unless someone has learned something new that they can bring into the conversation, you'll probably rehash the same possible solutions every single time. And that eventually will devolve into complaining because nothing ever changes anyway. This is another common complaint I hear about retrospectives. But by bringing in people from outside your team to help facilitate the retrospective, they bring with them their new a vantage point on the organization that might be different than yours. And they'll bring in ideas that they've seen other teams work on as they facilitated other team retrospectives in your organization. They may realize that, hey, five other teams I facilitated their retrospectives for, they all suffered from the same problem. And I know I'm the facilitator, but I want to at least share this with you so you know this is a solution that has worked for these other teams. You've now leveled up your retrospective to a whole new level because of that. So creating the circle of retrospective facilitators is an important way, in my mind, to shake things up outside of the team and share the role of the facilitator. Um, I do want to mention one thing, more thing there, though, which is the downside. It's something to be very aware of, which is one, one uh, aspect of retrospectives that, in my mind, is a global truth that you cannot shake if you're going to be successful in your retrospectives is you have to have an environment of psychological safety. So if the team doesn't feel safe speaking up, it doesn't matter what facilitation technique you pick. It doesn't matter who's there. It doesn't matter how long the retrospective is or where it takes place. You'll, it's very unlikely you'll arrive at learning uh, with the team. It's very unlikely you'll continuously improve. So psychological safety is critical. Now, if you bring in an external facilitator to your team, you are pushing the limits on psychological safety within the team because now you're talking to someone who you might not know very well. That's a risk. And therefore, what I recommend is that the team volunteers for this program. So not only do the facilitators volunteer to be in this circle of facilitators, but also teams should volunteer to have one of those facilitators come into their team for their retrospectives. It should be volunteer all across the board. Otherwise, you run this risk of devolving into, I don't want to speak up, who's this guy or girl? So um, that's a long-winded way of saying you can share the role of the facilitator, and it doesn't just have to be within the team. <laughs> In a past interview, you said that tools won't make remote retrospectives easy, but they will make them better. What are some advantages of remote retrospectives? I can think of anonymous safety checks. And is Retrium supporting that scenario? You mentioned one thing which is really critical, which is anonymity. Um, it's actually harder to be fully anonymous in person than it is in a remote team. It's much easier to be anonymous if you're remote. So of course, Retrium does support uh, that functionality. But there's other important things that uh, you can do with remote teams um, that help increase engagement also, besides just anonymity. Um, another one that's actually better for remote teams, <laughs> you know, I'll back up for a moment. Everybody always talks about how hard it is to be remote and how, what all the challenges are. And it's true, they absolutely are there, but it's also true that there are some things that are easier <laughs> if you're distributed. That's also very true. So I'm gonna to try to highlight a few of them. So the anonymity is one of them. Um, the, another big one is with dot voting. If you ever use dot voting um, with your, in your retrospectives to, for example, prioritize topics of discussion, it can be in many other things, it's actually better online or remote. And the reason is if you're in person and you're dot voting, I hate to publicize this, but the right strategy, if you are dot voting in person, is to wait until everyone else has dot voted. 
because then you can see how many votes have been cast on each item and you can strategically place your votes to make sure that your ideas are the ones that bubble up, right? So this is something I've seen many times people hack the system with dot voting. And it's very hard to overcome that if you're in person. If you are a remote team, then of course you can use uh, remote dot voting that's anonymous also, and also does not show people's results until after dot voting is closed. For example, we have that in Retrium so that you can't hack the system, meaning you end up with better results when it comes to prioritization through dot voting remote as opposed to, to in person. And there are many more examples of things like that as well um, that actually are better for remote teams. In a public talk about retrospectives, you mentioned the task ambassador role to ensure that tasks are followed up. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, the, actually, the reason that most people, when you drill down into it, uh, call retrospectives boring is not because the facilitation technique is the same and, you, and it gets boring because of that. It's actually because nothing is changing after the retrospective is over. And this is actually quite a logical response to a boring, ineffective meeting, is for you not to be engaged and not want to attend. If the meeting is a waste of time, why would you be engaged next time? So the root cause of most boredom in retrospectives is that it's not improving your lives as developers or your lives in the organization. So in terms of how does that connect back to your idea of a task uh, ambassador, um, it's important at the end of a retrospective when you've identified one area you're trying to improve upon, and hopefully it is just one because change is hard for people. And if you try to focus on too many things at once, it's highly unlikely you'll actually change anything. So hopefully you're narrowing in on one experiment, one small item of change. That's not good enough. A lot of teams stop there. That's not good enough because it's if no one is has volunteered, and that word was also chosen very intentionally, if no one has volunteered to um, be the task ambassador to drive that change through, to follow up on it, to make sure you're working on it, then this idea of collective responsibility, while it sounds good in theory in the ivory tower, in practice, usually what happens is the demands of your job and producing product um, supersede the the retrospective action item that you came up with. So um, you need to have someone, ideally, uh, who has volunteered to be the task ambassador, who's responsible for ensuring that at least you're trying to work on this in the upcoming iteration. So there, to dig in a little bit there a bit more, um, there's a great facilitation technique that I use uh, when there's a lot of possible actions that you might take uh, to uh, pick, you have to pick one, and there's a lot of possible actions on the table. What, what do you do, and how do you know which one to pick? Uh, so it's, it's, I always get the letters wrong. Let's see, it's E-I-E-C. So energy, uh, effort, impact, energy, and commitment. I think I got those right. I always have to think about them before I do it. Um, the idea is you want to pick something that there is energy behind. There's this idea in facilitation that uh, you want to follow the energy. So if it's true in facilitation in general, not just with action items. If there's energy around a subject, follow that as a facilitator. So make sure you're, you encourage talking about that. And it's also true with action items. If there's energy around an action item, that's a good thing to follow uh, and to encourage people to continue to work on. So this idea of effort, impact, energy, and commitment, you would have a list of all the action items up for suggestion. And you would yeah, dot vote a little bit in effort and dot vote a little bit in impact and maybe do t-shirt sizes and how much energy there is uh, around this. But you can play with how you actually facilitate it. But the idea is through this big visualization, you'd get a sense of what's going to have impact and hopefully take less effort and also there's energy to do. And once that happens, it's usually somebody will volunteer and say, yeah, I want, I'll be the task ambassador on that one. Because now you have this clear chart of which ones the team has energy behind. And usually when there's difficulty in um, someone volunteering to be a task ambassador is when you have come up with an action item that no one really wants to do. And if no one wants to do it, then of course it won't get done even if there is a task ambassador. So it's to me the combination of those two things. It's where's the energy, where is there going to be impact, and then having someone volunteer to um, be the ambassador to drive that change through. How do you involve introverts in remote retrospectives? The key in terms of understanding how to engage uh, people who are more introverted is to understand that introverts don't actually not want to share their ideas most of the time. They actually do want to share their ideas. They want to share them, though, in a way that they're comfortable sharing them. So 
verbal communication is stressful for a lot of introverts. And I can say that with confidence because for many years, I classified myself as, as an introvert. I don't think I'm as much of one anymore, but I very much used to be one. And I hated group conversations because I felt on the spot and it made me nervous and sweaty palms and I never wanted to speak. So, but I had ideas. And in those meetings, had someone presented sticky notes to me, um, and I would have time to think and to process before being put on the spot, I would have been very happy to share my ideas in those group meetings. So the same is true when it comes to retrospectives, and the same is true when it comes to remote retrospectives. Um, if you are trying to encourage people to participate who are more introverted in a remote retrospective, as long as you give them a communication paradigm that they're comfortable on, and usually that is one that's more um, asynchronous, so people have time to think, they have time on their own while others are thinking, and also maybe more written, uh, then it will you'll see higher broad-based adoption than you would if it was all a round-robin verbal communication. Uh, when it comes to something like the EIEC technique that I just spoke about, um, you know, a simple online whiteboard will do that for you. Just here are the action items we're considering, and um, you know, go ahead and put your ideas down up there on the whiteboard. Um, and that you'll get more ideas from the introverts that way than you would if you ask them on the spot. Hey, do you have an idea here? Um, do would you like to speak up? You'll typically get silence in that situation. David is the creator of Retrium, a tool to run remote retrospectives. I asked him how would have Retrium made his past remote retrospectives better. So I, I wish that we we had it back in the day. It would have made my job significantly easier. Um, so I can talk about why. Uh, there's a whole set of facilitation techniques on the platform uh, at this point. And so we talked about um, getting bored in retrospectives and how most people think it's because the facilitation technique's always the same. That's even more so the case for remote teams because it's hard to vary your facilitation technique when you're limited by the internet and by the medium. Uh, so we're trying to build out a suite of facilitation techniques. I mentioned Team Radar is on there, Lean Coffee is on there, um, a, num a number of the typical start, stop, continue, four L's, what went well, what didn't go well are on there. There's a variety of Team Radars on there, um, and we're adding more all the time now. Uh, and so just having that suite available is certainly helpful in keeping things more engaging. The other thing that's really helpful, though, is Retrium is not just a collaborative space to put ideas um, and then kind of free for all whiteboard, go for it. It's actually, we think of it as an educational tool because it's been designed from day one as a platform uh, that is guided by uh, the best practices in our industry. Um, and so when you launch a Team Radar retrospective on Retrium, as an example, you don't have to know what Team Radar is before you start that technique on the platform. The platform will guide you through the process live in real time um, so that you can learn as you're using the product. Um, and similar with Lean Coffee, if you don't know what that is, you've never facilitated it before, that's okay. The product will guide you through the Lean Coffee process. Uh, and so we, what we like to tell people, and we hope this is true, and it's from the feedback we think it is, that inexperienced retrospective facilitators have a lot to gain by adopting the product because it's a learning resource in addition to um, being a collaborative real-time experience for your team. If you had a magic wand and could add one feature to Retrium today, what would that be? There's so much. You've, op you've opened up Pandora's box here. We have a, a laundry list of things that we'd love to include in the platform. And many of them are, are focused on the team, but there's one big picture item that I'd love to have there uh, that is more focused to focus on the organization. And you know, th this feature is something that irrespective of whether you're using Retrium or not as a platform, it's something you should consider focusing on as a New Year's resolution for 2019, because uh, this more than anything else will help you level up your retrospectives as far as I'm concerned. So most teams, they run retrospectives and they are able to solve some issues at the team level, and they're able to work through some continuous improvement, all focused on the team. But more often than not, what will happen is at some point, the team will identify an issue that's out of their control. 
And most teams at that point will kind of say, well, we can't fix that anyway, and so let's move on. And it might come up again, and no matter what, it just kind of falls by the wayside and nothing ever changes with that item. And if that's really preventing your productivity, that's a, that's a problem. Um, and it needs there needs to be a fix there. So uh, one thing that you can do there, and this is where we'd like to head in Retrium itself, is let's say at the end of the retrospective, uh, you have identified five different items for change. Um, you can mark one of those five or two of those five or three of those five as public, meaning this is not something that only the team should know about. This is something that my director should know about or the organization at large should know about. But if it's intentionally saying this is something we can share to the rest of the company, it's opt-in, right? Again, so things should be private by default to the team. It's opt-in. Um, then you are making others in the organization aware of the fact that your team is struggling with issue X. Now, think about that in, on, at scale. So if you are a director inside this company and you have five teams reporting up to you and all of them are marking particular impediments as things that they're struggling with publicly to you, you can then look across those five teams and say, ah, four of the five are struggling with the same issue. I probably should do something. Um, and go up the chain to the VP. If the director is saying, here are the issues that I'm struggling with solving for my teams, I'm flagging this to you, and so on and so forth, to the SVP and eventually even to the CTO, that's information sharing that's pretty radical, it's pretty transparent, um, but it's something that if as a team you're struggling with issues outside of your control, you should consider doing. Now, the problem is it's very hard to operationalize that without a software product. Because if you're a company at scale, that data will get lost at some level. So that's where we want to go with Retrium. and we want to make this not just useful for facilitation at the team level, but also something that can really have a tremendous impact across the whole organization. We are almost at the end of the show, and it's time to ask the same three questions we asked to all our guests. David, what is your favorite retrospective activity, and can you share a story about that? That is a tricky question, my favorite one. Um, Okay, I'm going to go out of the box here and say something a little unusual. Um, there's a concept I like to talk about that is the 30-second retrospective. So there, there's this misconception that a retrospective is synonymous with a sprint retrospective. In fact, retrospectives predated Scrum. Uh, they are a concept that came out of project retrospectives by Norm Kurth a long time ago. And so there are many types of retrospectives. Sprint retrospectives are one. Um, there are project retrospectives. Um, there are heartbeat retrospectives. And this is the one that I want to talk about where rather than taking an hour or two hours or however long your retrospectives are to go through five phases and to really have team collective learning, um, a 30 second retrospective, a heartbeat retrospective is, let's say you and I bump into each other in the hall, or it can be virtual, because remember what I said, everything you can do in person, almost everything can also be done with these remote teams. Uh, you bump into the person in the hall and you say, hey, uh, I noticed that yesterday uh, there were some issues with the continuous integration server. What's going on? And you just ask them this brief question. It, it won't seem like a retrospective. It's an innocent question. But as the Scrum Master, um, if you ask that to somebody, you'll get some interesting piece of information. And you don't act on it. You just kind of file that away. But you're continuously having these casual hallway conversations, bump in 30-second conversations with people. And during the course of the sprint, if you keep hearing the same thing every time you're asking, hey, I noticed yesterday something's going on. What's up? You keep hearing the same thing. There's this concept, <laughs> concept in Lean um, called pulling the production line chain, um, where in the Toyota production system, uh, if the if there's an issue in the production line anywhere, anyone can pull this cord and it would stop the entire factory until they fixed that issue. So similar to that in software development, if we wait until the sprint retrospective to inspect and adapt and to learn, we might have wasted cycles where uh, if we had stopped earlier and inspected and adapted and learned, we could fix the problem earlier in the sprint. But because we think retrospectives are sprint retrospectives, we don't have that chance. So what I'm saying here is my favorite type of retrospective, the one I've actually seen work so, so well is when the Scrum Master focuses on asking these 30-second check-in heartbeat retrospectives. It's almost like muscle memory. Once you start doing it, you can't stop. Um, and you just collect this data early. And then if you need to, you stop and you, you inspect then.
Ah, uh, currently, I'm, I'm an avid reader. Uh, I love talking about books. So right now, I am reading Alexander Hamilton, uh, which has been popularized by the musical. Uh, it's a, a lengthy book, but it's about his life and times uh, during the American Revolution in the 1700s and how a much of a um, kind of aggressive figure he was. He stood alone uh, against his colleagues in many ways, and it's, it's fascinating. Um, I could talk all day about that, too, but <laughs> that's the book I'm currently reading. Yeah. Mm, favorite dish. Wow. Churros. <laughs> Let's go for the basics. If only I could have one thing in life, I think it would be churros. <laughs> yeah. Our guests share lots of insights and ideas. Which change are you going to try in your next retrospective? Tell us on Twitter with hashtag this is retrospective facilitation or leave us a comment on this is retrospective facilitation.com. You can connect with David on his email, david at retrium.com. Norm Kurt, known as the father of retrospectives and author of the book Project Retrospectives, suffered a disabling brain injury in a car accident 20 years ago. Visit thisisretrospectivefacilitation.com slash help Norm for details and a link on how to contribute to his fund. Thank you for listening. This is Enrico Teotti. Till next time.